Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great to be here today. And I hope everyone had a, a nice break for those 15 minutes and did something that was relaxing and just took you away from the screen for a little while. Screens being a way of life for us these days. I'm happy to be here today to talk about ways to effectively counsel our clients through this massive, unprecedented, ongoing, so many superlatives to describe this, this crisis caused by COVID-19. Our objectives today are to understand reactions, both in ourselves and our clients, to the pandemic in light of the disaster response phases, or what are commonly known as to be common reaction patterns in or to disaster events. We'll look at recognizing signs of critical incident or acute stress. We'll try to understand risk factors for developing PTSD and other post-disaster pathologies, and we will identify strategies to promote resilience and coping for, again, ourselves and our patients or clients. The Plague by Albert Camus, although it's a very serious book and topic, has been one of my top five books for a long time, and in fact, in a sort of oblique way, we even named our dog Bertie after Albert Camus, Bertie Camus Finch. <laughs> but it is really salient right now. I reread it after spending several years as a Red Cross volunteer and after serving in Hurricanes Katrina and the more Oklahoma tornadoes as a disaster responder. And even back then, uh, and about five or six years ago, I developed a talk about anticipating really exactly this kind of event, a pandemic, a pandemic illness that would affect a large population, very similar to the 1918 uh, flu pandemic. And definitely public health experts have been thinking about this potential for a very long time and have been predicting that we were due for one particularly in light of the movement from of animal viruses to humans like MERS and SARS and how deadly those viruses were. But there's always in human nature, always an element of disbelief or denial of such a threat and consequently a failure to truly prepare. And then bam, it's on us and here we are. We'll start by looking at definitions. What exactly is a traumatic event? Well, a traumatic event involves a psychologically distressing event outside the range of usual human experience. Check. Actual threatened or threatened death or serious physical injury to self or other. Check. A sense of intense fear, horror, and helplessness, and or helplessness. Check on that. And a disaster is a, is a traumatic event that affects an entire community or a large part of a community. Check that. Here we have global worldwide effects. But interestingly, I've, I've not been hearing the term disaster applied to our situation right now. But we definitely can consider it one. And we need to think of it on two levels, right? Or more than two levels probably, but two key levels are both health, th the threat to health, and the threat to economic well-being. We're facing and fearing both serious illness or death and also the possibility of unemployment or the reality of unemployment and the possibility or even already reality of financial ruin. We also look at, when we're thinking about responses to disaster, we also look at the characteristics of the event and how that, those characteristics can influence the psychological effects. We know that um, with the more human causation behind a disaster, there can be more psychiatric morbid morbidity. We can also look at whether it might be expected or unexpected. So like I said, we'd been expecting something like this to happen for a long time, but it was sort of a remote possibility. When we were 
then warned about it. There was a very short period of time from warning when we first heard about what was going on in China to, uh, to the actual coming or the spreading of the virus in our own country. So it was pretty sudden, all right? And then also when we think about timing of events, that's, that's a consideration, not so much that's affecting us now, but definitely with a hurricane or a tornado. Hurricanes, you usually have a little bit of warning. Um, with tornadoes, very little warning. And with earthquakes, usually no warning. So that also affects how we respond psychologically to, uh, to an event. But the whole thing about natural or human caused um, can, can really be a factor. And we know that we've found in studies that um, when it's a human caused event, there, is, there are more complicated emotions to it and it can create more down the line disturbances. Here in our situation now, you might notice that there are some efforts to kind of try to blame somebody or blame another country or blame, um, you know, delays in getting the appropriate treatment or the appropriate protective gear. And there may be certain factions in society that want to do that, that want to shift blame, but that, that the impact of that may be more negative in the long run. So we can keep that in mind in terms of trying to maybe avoid blame. And as I'll be talking about later in the talk, sort of accepting the situation without that element of, you know, trying to, trying to fix blame. But interestingly, sometimes blame can be a, uh, a uh, way of trying to defend against the awareness of lock, loss of control, of having no control over a situation. So sometimes it can seem perhaps more comforting to think somebody caused this versus I have no control over this at all. This is just something that happened and nobody can control it. That might be a more terrifying way of thinking about it. And then also with disaster situations, we, we often see this 80-20 rule that 80% of the casualties, the, the long-term casualties of a disaster event are psychological, while only a smaller percentage or 20% can be physical. Some of that data comes out of um, terrorism, for example, bioterrorism. And particularly that rule was seen with the sarin um, bioterrorist strikes in the, in the mass transit in, in Japan um, some years ago. So here, let's look at this chart, which depicts typical patterns of reactions to more typical disaster experiences. The difference with, with the pandemic we're experiencing now with COVID is that clearly there is no single event. There's no single impact, no date when this happened, you know, we, we had the warning, then this happened, and then everything was after that. No, this is ongoing. This is like a slow-moving train, a slow-moving, slow-motion tsunami of a, of a kind. And it also has negative effects that are trickling into every facet of life. But it can still help, I think, to understand and then normalize reactions to this, this situation. And I think particularly, we, we need to look at that disillusionment phase and be prepared for that being very prolonged because this, this, this illness and its effects are gonna be coming in waves. And I think that period, we're, it, we're already seeing evidence of this period now. I think we still see evidence of altruism and optimism and gratitude, particularly in terms of toward our first responders who are the heroes in our story right now. But that middle period, we're seeing a lot of this already. And, and some of that is, um, and, the, and the attendant negative emotions are um, where our clients may need our help, right? And with the main goals of coping and getting through it to that later recovery or reconstruction phase, which involves acceptance, adaptation, and integration. But I think we have a very long haul ahead of us and it helps again to know kind of what at least we know about ordinary, you know, ordinary extraordinary experiences. So let's look here at, um, at what is acute stress and, and, and how to understand that and how to interpret it. Since I was first trained in critical incident stress debriefing, 
And I actually had my, my initial training in critical incident stress debriefing on September 12th and 13th, 2011. I had already signed up for this training sometime in advance and 9-11 happened. And the trainer, uh, who was a wonderful, wonderful trainer associated with hospice here in, in the Triangle region, um, decided to have the training, you know, anyway, even though she knew that many of us were going to be having very raw emotions. And she had engineered the training, created this training to, to start with the first 20 minutes of screening of Saving Private Ryan, which is the landing on the beaches in Normandy. And she debated whether or not to show that, and she decided to go ahead and show it, and she did. Um, and we were just, the whole, the whole room was just sobbing. It was, it was really hard to, to get through that because of uh, everything that had happened the day before. Um, but since that time, and since doing that training, and I, that training became immediately helpful immediately afterward as I, as I was involved in helping in some workplaces to cope with the, uh, the fallout from 9-11, I've done multiple individual and group debriefings in work sites, in hospitals, in fire stations, even jewelry stores after robberies, and even uh, here in our area at a hotel where unfortunately a customer had suicided by, by jumping off of the roof. And in any of these situations, I always find, we always find as debriefers that the most important element of, of debriefing is the normalizing of symptoms of stress. Most people are really relieved to be told that they're not going crazy, that the symptoms we're about to look at are not evidence of, of going crazy, you know, or of being, of having lost it. Handouts that we use in, in CISDs list all the common components that we're about to review, and then they offer suggestions for coping. As Viktor Frankl said in a book I just reread recently because of these circumstances, Man's Search for Meaning, an abnormal reaction to an abnormal situation is normal behavior. Okay? It's, it's not, it would not really be normal to, to, to uh, be to stay completely normal when, when our situation is such as it is right now. And we always say in CISDs that you are having normal reactions to abnormal events, okay? But we do know that stress reactions do vary from person to person, and that, as we've already seen in talking about the ACE uh, examples and the elements of toxic stress, like Paul Lanier was talking about, that um, the severity and the duration of stress does play a role in how people manage and how they cope with their situations. So let's start with feelings. What are common feelings in reaction to stress? And to illustrate some of the following slides, I'm going to share a case example of an employee whose supervisor recently shared his story with me. I'll call him Jeff. And the man works in a commercial building maintenance. Okay. He was known by his supervisor to be in long-term recovery for alcohol dependence. Always wound a bit tight since the pandemic began, um, and Jeff was still having to go on to the site some, he began displaying and complaining of more anxiety and a sense of being overwhelmed. Particularly as we move into cognitive and behavioral domains, we see the downstream effects of the adrenaline fight, flight, or freeze response and the cortisol follow up. Jeff, this, this case client, evidenced a number of these cognitive difficulties, particularly self blame. He was beating himself up a lot, kind of for feeling the way he did or for struggling as much as he was. He also reported racing thoughts. So here, and with that self-blame, we also have the problem, which is quite common, of what I call secondary emotions. That's like having an emotion about your emotion, and particularly usually a critical one or a self, self-judging one. It's like judging yourself for, as weak for feeling fearful and then also feeling ashamed. So one strategy that I often use and that is, is used in CBT is to validate the primary emotion. Of course, you're feeling fearful and anxious, um, but challenge the secondary ones, particularly, or, and, and particularly when they are more destructive and self-defeating, which they often are. 
and now physical effects. Many of these physical effects likewise are directly linked to the downsides of the adrenaline and cortisol processes. Cravings for food, drugs, and alcohol can be accentuated right now by the stay-at-home order and its uh, associated boredom and cabin fever. And with our case example, Jeff, he complained of fatigue and told his supervisor that after work, he was going home and curling up in a fetal position, unable to attend to any household chores or taking care of his kids, helping out his wife. He also had both early and middle insomnia and was eating only minimally. So having looked at thoughts, feelings, and physical effects, which all kind of lead to and mediate what a, a behavior may, may then ev be evidenced, um, Jeff's situation unfortunately came to a head when he lost control of his of his feelings and his temper, lashed out at his wife, became aggressive, physically assaulted her, and after she called 911, he was jailed for several days. He then revealed to his supervisor that he had a history of bipolar disorder and had relapsed to alcohol after, as I said, several years of sobriety. The supervisor recommended that he go to a facility, um, a dual diagnosis kind of facility for evaluation, which he did, and then he agreed to inpatient admission. And last that the supervisor knew, he was a, a patient in that facility. So there I'm gonna give a quick segue and say, you may already know this, but particularly with hospitals being more attuned right now to caring for people with COVID, um, that if you do have someone who is in need of emergency psychiatric care, it's a great idea to try to send that person to an ancillary facility. Like here in the Triangle, we have uh, Triangle Springs, for example, or we have Holly Hill, and um, I'm sure there are other, other um, facilities that are even hosting or even sponsoring the Governor's Institute uh, conference today that, are, that would be good resources in this time when the hospitals really are um, very busy tending to patients with the, with the virus. So Jeff's was a pretty dramatic unraveling. Had he been a patient of yours, um, we're gonna be looking at interventions that could have been made sooner along the way and perhaps prevent such a damaging trajectory. And it's important here to keep in mind too that spiritual crises can also occur under circumstances like these. We may ask, and people may ask, why me? You know, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my loved one? Why is this happening now? How could God let this happen? You know, people may also, and we're seeing that a lot of people are missing their usual ways of celebrating their faith. Um, they're missing the the person-to-person -person interactions and the support that they get from their fellow congregants. Now, my own mom was a very devout Catholic, and. Um, Unfortunately, she, she died last October. If she were alive today, there are many ways in which this circumstance would be very, very trying for her. But I know one key way would be that she would not be able to go to church and that she also would worry greatly about not being able to receive communion. So this is something that we can be attuned to in ourselves and our, and our patients and clients around what's going on with them spiritually. And as we know, spirituality is often a very important linchpin for um, the AA program. So hopefully people who are involved in AA are still getting that need met in some ways by continuing to attend meetings um, online because there are all the meetings. Most of the meetings have now moved to online, which is great. And so those have all been the typical reactions for adults. We're gonna talk briefly about children and uh, essentially, the stress reactions in children are very similar to those in adults. There are a few, few differences that are important to note. But uh, generally, for our patients who are parents, we can help them recognize and more effectively respond to how stress manifests in first themselves as adults, but then, and then in their children. It's really scary, I think, to complicate the future imprint of this pandemic on children. It's been hard enough trying to help them through 9-11 and then the seemingly ubiquitous school shootings. 
being out of school now, on the one hand, there's no school shootings, that's, that's a plus, but being out of school leaves kids feeling really socially bereft at a time when that social um, socialization for children is so important. And of course, families whose parents work are hard pressed to take care of them, you know, all day long. Food insecurity is also exacerbated with schools being closed. And uh, however, many schools are trying to keep their lunch programs going, which is, which is great for that need. But just the disruption of routines, the separation from family members, like, you know, my husband and I are very sad that we can't personally interact with our grandson. I'm hearing that from a lot of grandparents, um, particularly. That's, it's just, it's just, it's really hard. And we really feel that, that loss right now. And the children feel it. So one of the key areas of, you know, th to look at in children, um, while the feelings and the thoughts and everything are, are pretty similar as to adults, um, we look at the behaviors and um, most, most of them can offer clear signs, like particularly regressive behaviors, clear signs of distress. Regressive behaviors like bedwetting or clinginess when the child is otherwise past those, change, those stages. So here we can emphasize to parents the importance of taking care of themselves first so that they can feel more relaxed in dealing with their children. It's that old oxygen mask metaphor, right? When the oxygen mask come down in the plane, you know, when the plane is in distress, you put your mask on first and then put the mask on your child. So we want to help them try to empathize with and respond patiently to their kids when they are evidencing any of these kinds of behaviors and signs of distress. And something we've learned through disaster response is that most people are resilient. Most will go through this and some may prove stronger for it as in that old adage, but some are at risk, okay? Um, as, uh, as was talked about earlier in terms of the, the ACEs, higher exposure to danger or any exposure to danger can prove an opportunity, right? So there's going to be some who are resilient, some who get through it, but we're going to consider what some of the risk factors are for people who might have a harder time getting through it. And then we're going to learn and look at how to help offset them. So again, thinking about the, all, the, all the symptoms that I just went through, if a person were evidencing, as you know, any of those symptoms or a number of those symptoms, and they were resulting in some kind of impairment, an impairment of functioning, impairment of keeping up with your usual duties, if that was all occurring within the first month of exposure to the situation, that would be diagnosed as acute stress disorder. If it occurs a month later, uh, and those symptoms occur. And then, of course, if criteria for PTSD um, are met, then that could technically be PTSD. So here we are, we're, we're already 30 days past the beginning of this event, right? At least technically. But it still hasn't maybe affected a lot of people more personally. So this is going to be a hard one to, to tease out just in terms of diagnosis and treatment. But let's just keep that in mind in terms of the differences between those two things. And the hope is that we, we can intervene soon enough to keep these downstream negative impacts from continuing and worsening. So most of this data for risk factors um, comes from two meta-analytic studies, one by Ozer et al. from 2003 and another from Brewin et al. from 2000. They cited the factors most strongly correlated with later pathology to be the ones you see on the screen. Prior affective anxiety disorders, exposure to prior stressors, poor social support, family history of psychopathology, and lack of psychological resilience. If we go back to our case example, right, we know that Jeff had a history of bipolar disorder. I don't know more than that about his past, but regarding prior traumatic stressors, for example, one study of Katrina survivors found 
that those who had experienced two to five prior traumatic experiences were less likely to develop PTSD, while those who, who had had none or who had had six or more had a higher chance, similar to the effects of higher ACE scores, right? So this can be seen as maybe a defining element of resilience, that being tempered by fire can make you come out stronger for it. You can't be resilient without trials, but we have to keep in mind or you know, there can be a, 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 a worse impact or a worse outcome when there are too many fires, trials or that fire is too all-consuming. And then for exposure-based factors, what happens when they, when they confront or are confronted by the disaster experience? These factors were used by the Red Cross to help general volunteers identify which clients being served should be referred to disaster mental health volunteers for more than the basic psychological first aid that everyone is trained in, okay? So this is direct, you know, kind of exposure. Um, how, how, how much is this affecting them personally? Direct threat, um, direct illness of someone you, you know uh, or love, yourself or someone you love. Um, so we want to be aware of patients' current experiences regarding to that virus exposure. And uh, we also want to be aware of actual or threatened job loss or other economic hardship. And then next we can consider and assess the person's immediate during the crisis behaviors and responses. High extended reactivity or lability can bode poorly as it heightens CNS stimulation and inhibits cognitions and rational appraisal. Dissociation would be an extreme form of such disconnect. Few or no social resources leave people unable to console or get out of their own heads for a while, and it also leaves them unlikely to be consoled. Poor downstream prognoses might also be more likely in people who can't adjust or adapt, that kind of inflexibility, can't adjust or adapt to necessary changes. Um, so there, I think we can witness some of the ongoing liberation movements, right, that are happening, the state liberation movements or the people who are occupying state capitals with AK-47s. These are extreme inflexible reactions to the situation you know, of the moment. With Jeff, we saw some highly reactive responses like um, excess anxiety and then his curling into a fetal position every day after work, his, his inability to cope, etc. So we saw that high reactivity in him. As we turn now to the basics of helping, um, I want to remind, post a reminder to us all, that our first prerogative is to take care of ourselves. In fact, with Red Cross, a lot of people don't realize that the role of the Red Cross Disaster Mental Health Volunteer was created to help Red Cross volunteers and staff, much more than to help the clients of the disaster responses. And that's because this kind of work that we are doing now, trying to help others get through this crisis situation, is extremely taxing. We can experience vicarious trauma, we're going through the trauma ourselves. Our, our physiology is aroused by it, you know? So we really need to help ourselves. I'm hoping that with what I'm gonna say now in terms of the strategies for, for working through it and for calming ourselves as we get through it can be something that we all are doing for ourselves. There's no us and them in this situation. We are all affected. And also those of us who are more vulnerable in any of the ways I've just described, need to be especially careful and not overload. And again here, um, normalization of symptoms is very helpful. 
bottom line, normalization, as is validation of the emotional experience. I think it's good to be real, right, and to share our own experiences and our own efforts to cope, right, and even our sometimes our own efforts at, at humor. I had a fun interaction with a client the other day where we were bemoaning the urge to eat more, and I was revealing that my, my downfall, if I have it in the house, is hummus with tortilla chips because I ordinarily will take a full serving of hummus per chip, and that's not necessarily the best. <laughs> so just being real about that can be helpful. Um, and, and then also we can guide anxious and distractible patients you know, who are losing some of that executive functioning that we talked about earlier to choose one or two short-term tasks even write them down, right? Just to complete a couple of tasks, point them to practical resources like dialing 211 for a list of local programs that can be helpful. That can also make a positive difference. And then even that great idea shared earlier by Michael King of the happy place, you know, just going to your happy place by looking at a nice picture on your phone, that in itself can be a just great intervention. And whenever I talk about counseling skills and the facets of, you know, of counseling strategies, I, I always like to turn to AA because the simple adages of AA are perfect points of reference right now. I call them undercover CBT. Things like halt, you know, if you're feeling a craving, you're feeling irritable, ask yourself, am I hungry, angry, lonely, or tired? And then try to solve that problem. Phrases like keep it simple, easy does it. First things first, do the next right thing. You know, great, great advice, right? And if patients are actually engaged in AA, all the better, of course. And if not, they're still likely to know this prayer, the serenity prayer, which I like to use as a guideline for what dialectical behavior therapy calls our main three options for action when faced with a negative emotional state. We can change the situation, we can change our reaction to the situation, or we can accept the situation and our reaction as they are, okay? Now, uh, Marshall Linehan always said that there's also a fourth, a fourth option, which is to stay miserable, but we don't recommend that one. So first, if the situation is causing pain, can some aspect of it be changed? Here we can think about the elements that are within our control, like prioritizing something that I can do right now, something within my control. Maybe I can uh, apply for unemployment, right? Um, maybe I can uh, negotiate with, a, with one of my um, utilities to reduce my payment for a little while, right? And also, too much media exposure can be very anxiety provoking, particularly news exposure. So I'm often talking to my clients about really minimizing that, limiting it maybe to an hour in the morning, no more than an hour in the morning, no more than an hour in the evening and well before you're going to bed, right? Don't go to bed with this on your mind. And generally speaking, I've been avoiding articles about what might happen right? If so and so or such and such, right? Because projections are often exaggerated and scary. Focus on coping with what is and take it a day at a time or a week at a time. I know we're all promoting following public health guidelines. We can also encourage making and, and maintaining social connections. And those with few or no social connections because some of my clients are in that boat right now we can encourage them to try joining online meetings online aa online meetup groups there are lots of support groups happening currently that are online so any of those things can be can be things people can do our second option if we can't change the situation or if we're still at loose ends is to try easing our reaction to it Foundational physiological self-care is critical now, particularly in light of this long unwinding of this disaster. We should look for the sweet spot of observing and describing emotions as they come and go without judging or pushing them away. I think journaling can really help people with this kind of processing and journaling will also preserve a record of this historic period, right, of this experience. Meditation apps abound, many are free, 
my favorite is called Insight Timer with over, over 25,000 guided meditations of all lengths and types. Remember also that what you focus on, you get more of. Think about what you're grateful for and look for ways to help others. Going outside, absolutely. I see a lot of people getting outside, enjoying nature, planting gardens, playing in the street, observing wildlife, lots of fun pictures of that online. And uh, this morning I took a walk with the dog before the conference started and felt just a little bit of joy seeing the um, mountain laurel blooming in the woods. I did feel a little bit sad that we weren't in Asheville where I could maybe enjoy even more of that. So there's that kind of bittersweet, the, the, the joy with the sadness too. Finally, when all is said and done and the sad and worried, lonely or fearful feelings are still there, we can work on accepting that some scarring may be inevitable. We can ask for help and support. We can grieve the loss of simple things like going to the movies with a group of friends. And of course, the bigger losses of loved ones or of work and money. As Frankel noted, so much depends on our attitude. We always have a choice as to that. And again, resilience is thought to hinge on that ability to hold the seemingly opposite emotions, like sadness and joy, simultaneously. These four M's of mental health are another simple way to remember key activities that can be protective of mental health. They were mentioned during the One World Together at Home concert that was spearheaded by Lady Gaga a couple of weeks ago. Another celebrity effort worth recommending right now is John Krasinski's YouTube series called Some Good News or SGN. The one featuring the Hamilton cast was, was a lot of fun. I think that was uh, the, the second one. I think he's up to maybe, I think he's done five or six installments so far. A fifth M or meaning was identified by Frankel as a pivotal element in his own and others survival in the Holocaust. As he put it, if we have a why, we can survive almost any how. Trying to find the lessons in this pandemic, using the time to inculcate positive habits or to do something helpful for others, or learning how not to take things we care about for granted, all these and many others are ways we might use it for good and make it meaningful. Throughout the book, The Plague, the main character, Dr. Rayu, tirelessly serves his patients and loses many until the wave finally slows. Like him, at the most basic level, what we can and should focus on is doing our jobs, putting our skills to use, and helping ourselves, our families, our friends, our patients, neighbors, and larger communities to endure this trial and hopefully come out the other side better for it. There are certainly darker, angrier, less decent elements at play in our society today, as there always have been. To give a nod to Freud and the wise Greeks he borrowed from, life rests on the balance of eros and thanatos, love and death. We can be aware of death, yet choose love as long as we're alive. As Camus concluded, there is much to admire in our kind. He also said that what's true of all the evils in the world is true of plague as well. It helps men to rise above themselves. Thanks for listening, and I hope you all stay strong and well.